finally, I, I know you folks did not come here to hear me talk. Um, so I wanted to um, uh, get off the stage. Uh, but first, I would like to introduce our keynote uh, speaker. Dr. Peter Glick is the co-founder and president of the Pacific Institute from Oakland, California. The Institute is one of the world's leading nonpartisan policy research groups addressing global environment and uh, development problems, especially uh, problems associated with water. Dr. Glick is an internationally recognized uh, water expert. He received a bachelor's of science from Yale University, a master's of science and PhD from University of uh, California, Berkeley, and is a legacy, meaning his mother actually was a uh, Connecticut College student, which uh, we're very, very happy to grab it, even a little piece of, uh, of his resume if possible. Uh, Dr. Glick is the author of more than uh, 80 peer-reviewed papers and book chapters and six books, including the Biennial Water Report, uh, The World's Water. In 2003, he received a MacArthur uh, Foundation Fellowship, which is also known as uh, a Genius Award, which has got to be a pretty good thing, obviously, uh, for his work on global water issues. In 2006, he was elected to the U.S. National Academy of Sciences. His work on sustainable management and use of water led him to being named by the BBC as a visionary on the environment and its essential guide to the 21st century. And finally, in 2008, Wired magazine called him one of the 15 people the next president should listen to. Now it is our great pleasure to give you the chance to listen to Dr. Peter Glick. Thank you, Doug. Thank you very much. Uh, and let me add my thanks to all the sponsors and organizers. It's a hard thing pulling together a conference like this, and I appreciate the invitation, and I'm always happy to come back to Connecticut. Uh, the title of my lecture is Water, New Thinking in the 21st Century. What I'd like to do is argue that uh, we're desperately in need of new thinking in the water area, that the way we use water, the way we think about water is out of balance, that it's unsustainable. Uh, and we hear headlines every day that let us know that this is true from resurgent cholera in Zimbabwe because of the failure of the government there, to depleted reservoirs in California and ongoing drought in the southeast, uh, to farmers killing farmers over water in Africa, to cities shutting down farms for their water in China. I believe that ultimately, and I would argue inevitably, we're going to move to a sustainable path for water. I think we have no choice, and I think that's the good news to what I call a soft path for water. But there are many routes to get there, uh, and it's not clear to me that we're going to choose the least painful of the routes. And what I'd like to do is talk about some of those paths today. I'm going to do two, th two uh, three things. I'm going to talk about why I think there's a water crisis. Uh, I'm going to talk about why I think that water crisis is getting worse and not better. And I'm going to talk about why I think it doesn't have to get worse. I'm going to talk about solutions to our water challenges, uh, I'm going to talk about a path to a sustainable future. And because this is specifically a conference on water scarcity and conflict, I'm going to especially touch on this issue of water and conflict. Uh, it's an issue we address at the Pacific Institute. We've worked for a long time on the issue of conflict over water. But I'm also going to talk about Sumerian myths and Babylon and Julius Caesar and Cleopatra and peak oil and perchlorate and Martian snowfall, and Dante's Inferno, and Milwaukee, and of course, camels. Water issues are not just scientific issues, nor are they simply matters of policy and economics. Uh, they're all of those things. And depending on whether you're an optimist or a pessimist, I think there are opportunities and challenges enough for all of us. Uh, we have old problems old water-related problems that we have failed to solve, and we have a set of new challenges. Uh, the old problems and the new problems, they, they include things like water scarcity, just not having enough water, water contamination from industrial and human wastes, water-related diseases from cholera and dysentery and, and schistosomiasis uh, and malaria, uh, the effects of climate change and extreme events on water availability and quality, challenges to the production of food and goods and services, ecosystem degradation and destruction, and all of the social and political challenges associated with 
finding and using what is a scarce natural resource, from depletion to pollution to inequitable use to fundamental threats to national and international security. I'd like to argue that the old ways of thinking about water are not adequate any longer. Water is not just a natural resource. It's not just a, a factor of production the way we used to think about it. Uh, it's not just an input. Water is special. Uh, it has deep security, economic, cultural, and social challenges. And, and the truth is, people care enormously about water. In order to address these challenges, we need new tools, scientific tools, certainly, technological tools, certainly, but also economic, institutional, and educational tools. And we're going to have to challenge the conventional thinking about water. We're going to have to challenge the status quo. We've made enormous progress in dealing with water problems. Anyone who says that all of the news about water is bad is wrong. There's plenty of good news about water, and I'll come back to some of that toward the end. But there's plenty of bad news, too. Uh, and that's going to require some new thinking. That new thinking that, in fact, in my opinion, may be the hardest challenge of all. So first, why do I think there's a water crisis? Well, there are many pieces to this. There's uh, a human dimension to the water crisis, there's an environmental dimension, and there's a political dimension. I'll talk about all three. But to me, the human dimension of the water crisis is the worst, and it's the most inexcusable, and it's the most worthy, if you will, of the label crisis. There are probably a billion people worldwide today that don't have access to safe drinking water. There are probably two and a half billion people worldwide, maybe 40% of the world's population, that don't have access to adequate sanitation services, something I bet everyone in this room basically takes completely for granted. It's very rare that at any given point in our day-to-day -day lives, we're more than a few meters from safe drinking water or adequate sanitation. But that's not true for huge numbers of people on the planet. And that's partly what I mean by inexcusable. And the failure to meet basic human needs for water, the failure to have access to safe drinking water, the failure to have basic sanitation services, lead to water-related diseases. Billions of cases of water-related diseases a year. Two million deaths a year from dysentery, cholera, diarrheal diseases, the, the water-related diseases that effectively we got rid of in the industrialized world when we put in place high-quality municipal water systems. And most of those deaths are from small children, children under the age of five, and all of them are preventable. And that's also what I mean by inexcusable. There are around 100 million people in Bangladesh and parts of West Bengal, India, and Nepal that are drinking water with too much arsenic in it, naturally occurring arsenic. But again, we've known for decades that there's too much arsenic in groundwater in these regions, and yet they're still drinking water with too much arsenic. Again, it's not a technological problem. We know how to solve these kinds of problems. It's a social, a political, and economic, and institutional challenge. And that's also what I mean by inexcusable. And even here in the United States, really, no real efforts have been put in place to integrate water planning and human needs and uh, land use planning with the kind of results that we see around Atlanta and the cities of southern Florida and all of the cities in the south western United States and Los Angeles and basically everywhere where there are growing challenges over water scarcity, water allocation, and water quality. And that leads to overuse of water and misuse of water and some of the ecological challenges associated with our water use. And that is the second dimension of this water crisis. There is a major environmental dimension to our water problems. For too long, Humans have taken the water that we need from the ecosystems that also need that water, and we've sort of ignored that. We've pretended or we, we didn't know that ecosystems needed water. And as a result, those ecosystems which provide us with, with fundamental goods and services that, again, we frankly don't completely appreciate, are also now being devastated. The most threatened species and ecosystems on the planet are those that need the water that we use for our own purposes. And we either consume that water or we contaminate it. Fisheries, river deltas, inland wetlands, migratory routes, they're all threatened by the way we use water. 
by some estimates, 30 to 40 percent of all freshwater fish species and amphibians in North America are now considered threatened or endangered, primarily because of the way we use water. The Colorado River, the Yellow River in China, many other rivers no longer reach the sea because we take out all of the water upstream and we use it for growing food, for our industrial purposes, for our residential and domestic purposes. And so the deltas that used to depend on those water resources are now being destroyed. Other rivers are so heavily contaminated uh, that their natural ecosystems are destroyed, or frankly, they're so heavily contaminated that downstream humans can't use the water. It's hard to think of a major river or a freshwater ecosystem that doesn't face some kind of serious ecological challenge because of the way we use water. Uh, one of the earliest examples in the United States of our failure to understand and integrate land use planning and water use planning and ecosystem needs uh, is the Everglades. And now we're talking about spending $8 billion or $9 billion or more to try and restore at least some sense of balance in the Everglades. And we're talking about spending billions of dollars in the Sacramento San Joaquin Delta in California to try and restore fisheries to prevent salmon from going extinct on the West Coast. More and more you can see ecosystems that are being destroyed and more and more we're beginning to think about how to restore some ecological function, how to restore some water to those ecosystems. And that in turn is raising competition with cities, with farms, uh, and it's leading to some of the political dimensions of this, which I'll come back to. Uh, another environmental aspect of the water challenge is that water quality is deteriorating in many places from biological and industrial wastes in mixes we don't often expect with consequences we often don't understand. More than 30 years ago, uh, and many of you won't remember this from personal experience, but some of you may, uh, the Cuyahoga River in Ohio caught fire and it burned on national television. And I remember watching and this is the days when there were only basically three news stations on TV, and all of them had, had film of the Cuyahoga River catching fire and the firemen standing around, and I, I, they didn't know what to do. And what it was was a mixture of industrial wastes and solid wastes that had just been dumped into the Cuyahoga River and had caught fire, and there's, there's no good way to put out a river that's burning. And for, for those of you who like Randy Newman, there's a wonderful song that Randy Newman wrote about that event. But that event actually led to fundamental changes in water quality laws in the United States. It led to the Clean Water Act, uh, controlling industrial contaminants. It led to the Safe Drinking Water Act, which, which regulates contaminants in our drinking water. Fifteen years later, uh, 15 years ago, Milwaukee was hit by an outbreak of uh, waterborne disease by cryptosporidium that probably killed 100 people and made 400,000 people sick because we didn't regulate for cryptosporidium in the Safe Drinking Water Act. And that led to new filtration rules for our drinking water laws. Ten years ago, we discovered the insidiousness of something called MTBE in our groundwater. MTBE was something we added to our gasoline to make it burn more efficiently, to reduce an air quality problem. And it turned out to reduce an air quality problem and lead to a terrible water quality problem. And that led to changes in the mix of our gasoline. Five years ago, we found traces of medicines and endocrine disruptors and antibiotics in our water, uh, in part because we put more and more of those things in our water, and in part because in the past we didn't use to look for them. And we still don't completely appreciate the extent to which those may or may not be a health risk. Three years ago, we realized the scale of our per perchlorate problem. Uh, perchlorate is an industrial contaminant it's found in rocket fuel, it's found in a lot of things, and increasingly it's found in our groundwater. What will it be next year? I don't know, it'll be something. We always seem to be a little bit behind the curve in monitoring and developing regulations to protect our water resources and in enforcing those regulations. And in perhaps one of the worst examples of our ability to massively disrupt the environment, we're changing the climate. The evidence is clear and compelling that not only will climate change occur, but that climate change is already occurring and that it's a result of human activities and the emissions of greenhouse gases. And for those of you who remember your second grade science, the hydrologic cycle 
that is evaporation and the formation of clouds and condensation and precipitation and runoff and evaporation and transpiration again. That's the hydrologic cycle. But that's also the climate cycle. As the climate changes, we will fundamentally change the hydrologic cycle. We'll change evaporation rates. We'll change when and where it rains. Uh, we'll change uh, precipitation and storm frequency in events. We will change our water resources. And that will in turn affect our ability to grow food, our demand for water, our supply of water. Basically, as we change the climate, we will fundamentally change the underlying water resources on which we all depend. Furthermore, the water system that we've built to collect water, to store water, to move water from one place to another, to treat water, was built using a fundamental assumption that the future climate's going to look like the past, that the uh, rainfall patterns that we know of over the last 100 years are the rainfall patterns that we're going to get in the next 100 years, that the frequency and intensity of storms that we got over the last hundred years will be the same in the future. And if there's anything that the climate community is telling us, it's that that's no longer true, that the future climate is not going to be the same as the past climate. And that calls into question the water system that we built in the past, how we operate it, and what we ought to be doing to manage that system in the future. We can no longer afford politicians and policymakers who hide behind scientific uncertainty and ignorance to delay taking action on climate. It's fundamental for the smart management of our water system in the future. And that leads to the third dimension of the crisis. That's the political dimension. There is a political dimension to the water crisis. Half of the land area of the world is in what we call an international river basin. That means Again, going back to your second grade hydrology, water falls out of the sky into a watershed. That water runs off into a river. Half of the land area of the world is in an international river basin. The rivers that fall, the, the water that flows in those rivers uh, uh, are shared by at least two or more nations around the world for half of the land area of the planet. We don't think about this very much in the United States. Very little of our land area is in an international river basin although some of it is. Uh, we only have two neighbors, Canada and Mexico, uh, but even so, we share the Rio Grande, we share the Colorado. Even a little bit of the Mississippi River is in uh, uh, falls on, in the land area of Canada. There are basically over 260 international, major international rivers, and I think uh, you'll hear much more about this with later speakers, but I think you'd be hard-pressed to name a really big river worldwide river that isn't actually an international river. Uh, the Danube is shared, which isn't all that big, the Danube is shared by 18 nations. The Nile is shared by 10. Uh, uh, the Amazon, the Jordan, the, the Ganges, the Brahmaputra, all of these are international rivers. As a result, water is a source of tension, political tension. Uh, I would argue even when it's not crossing an international border, it can be a source of political tension. I'll come back to that in a second. But there is a very long history of conflict over water resources. Fights over water, fights with water, fights that start for some other reason entirely, but where water is a tool or a target of conflict uh, during warfare. Um, one of the things that we do at the, at the Pacific Institute is we maintain a chronology, for those of you who like history, uh, a chronology of water-related conflicts that goes back 5,000 years. Uh, Google the water conflict chronology or go to worldwater.org, world water one word, and look for, the, look for this history of conflict. There's some wonderful examples. I'll, I'll give you a couple in a minute. Um, but basically, water and politics make a volatile mix. And let me just give you a couple of, a couple of examples. Uh, around 3000 BC, uh, there is an ancient Sumerian legend that recounts the deity Ea, E-A, who punished humanity for its sins by inflicting uh, earth with a six-day-long deluge. Now, if this sounds a little bit like Noah, it's probably no coincidence, but this ancient Sumerian myth precedes the legend of Noah. Uh, and there's very there's similarities and there are differences, but it's a great example of uh, a deity, in this case, punishing, using water as a weapon for whatever reason. Uh, in 1700 B.C., a grandson of Hammurabi 
uh, dammed the Tigris River in ancient Mesopotamia to prevent the retreat of rebels who were fighting with Babylon, ancient Babylon. In 49 BC, Julius Caesar and Cleopatra, this is the real Julius Caesar and the real Cleopatra, uh, took refuge on the island of Pharos in the, in the harbor of Alexandria in, in, uh, in ancient Egypt. This is a wonderful story, and I, I don't have time to go into it, but I, I mean, why is, Julius, why, why is Julius Caesar and Cleopatra, why, why is he in Babylon? Why is he in Alexandria at all? Is a great story. But he takes refuge in the island of Pharos. There's a, a, a war between the Romans, basically, and the army of Alexandria, headed by Ptolemy. Uh, and during this siege, Ptolemy's army pumps salt water into the freshwater systems of uh, this fortress in order to try and force Julius Caesar out. Uh, if we fast forward to the present, in August of 2007, in Burkina Faso and Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire, Declining rainfall and drought have led to fights between farmers and pastoralists and animal herders uh, with competing needs for water resources. And I know there will be a talk later at this conference about drought and conflict. In October of 2008, the Taliban uh, in, uh, threatened to blow up uh, a dam that is the main water supply for the city of, of Peshawar. There are many, many examples. There are hundreds of examples in this chronology. Uh, and some of them are really interesting from a historical perspective. Uh, another political dimension to this, there is a very strong disconnect between our water laws and our water rights system. This is certainly true in the Western United States. It's true in many parts of the world. Uh, and there's a disconnect between our water laws and the hydrologic reality of our water resources. Uh, basically, we live in a 21st century controlled by 19th century politics, uh, if, luck, if we're lucky, 20th century politics. But the institutions and the water laws we have in place, I'm going to argue, are not adequate to deal with the reality of the 21st century. So why do I believe the water crisis is getting worse and not better? Well, I don't have a crystal ball. Uh, my ability to forecast the future is no better than yours. Uh, and I would remind you, for those of you who have not read Dante's Inferno lately, uh, there is a serious danger to predicting the future. And Dante's Inferno, just to remind you, uh, again, go back and read it if you haven't read it or haven't read it recently. But, but Dante's Inferno is basically, it's an allegory uh, about hell. And Dante describes the, the circles of hell and each of the circles of hell starting from the top where very minor sinners and sins are represented all the way down to, to the ninth circle of hell where the devil is and the uh, the, the, basically, the sins get worse and worse as he makes this trip down these circles of hell. And way down near the bottom, I'm pretty sure it's in the eighth circle of hell, are fortune tellers and prognosticators, those who deign to look into the future. And, I mean, if you were writing it today, presumably climate modelers and economic forecasters, economic forecasters especially. But um, So I'm really not trying to predict the future, but but... I do think the water crisis is getting worse, uh, primarily because population is growing. Uh, tied to all of our environmental challenges is the population problem. Uh, and population is growing fastest in the places, ironically, where water is often the scarcest. Uh, the Middle East, the Persian Gulf, North Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, there's no problem on Earth, probably, that isn't made worse by a rapidly growing population. Um, and even where we think water is abundant, and even where populations may be growing more slowly, I think we're seeing increasing competition for water resources. I think the water problem is getting worse because of disagreement and paralysis over what to do about it. There's no real agreement and a lot of political dispute over how to, how to address our water problems. It's getting worse because efforts and programs to deal with water problems are inadequate to the scale of the problem. I think we're not working hard enough on the water problem. And it's getting worse because we've delayed so long in dealing with some of these problems, like climate change, uh, that we're now unavoidably committed to very serious problems that we might not have had to deal with if we had started addressing these challenges eight years ago, say, or 10 years ago, or 12 years ago, or before. And it's getting worse because, as I've hinted, I think we're mired in old thinking and entrenched interest and a lack of political inspiration 
and leadership, and maybe that's now changing for the better. Uh, in a recent article I wrote with a colleague of mine at the Pacific Institute, Mina Palanyapin, we talk about something called peak water. Uh, and we've argued that in many parts of the world we're already passing the point of peak water and peak ecological water. Now, what do we mean by this? I don't mean to suggest we're running out of water. Water is a renewable resource. We will never run out of water, unlike oil, uh, when you often hear a discussion about peak oil. Water is mostly a, a renewable resource, but it's not entirely a renewable resource. Uh, there are many parts of the world where, like oil, water is a non-renewable resource, where we have fossil groundwater aquifers, by which I mean basically groundwater aquifers that we pump faster than nature recharges them. And when we do that, groundwater levels drop. It becomes more and more expensive to get the next gallon of water out, very much like oil. And in those places, we are seeing examples of peak, peak water. We are running up against the limits of either a non-renewable supply of water or we are using renewable water resources to the limits when we can no longer tap more renewable water resource out of a river that may be renewable but is limited in its absolute amount of availability. But there's another issue here, uh, and that's something we call peak ecological water. I'm going to argue that we've passed the point of peak ecological water in many parts of the world. That is the point where pumping another gallon of water or another cubic meter of water causes more harm than it provides benefit. Now, we're very bad at measuring ecological benefits. It's much easier to measure the economic benefit of using a gallon of water. It's very difficult to measure the economic costs from an ecological perspective of using another gallon of water. But in parts of the world, there are points where using more water from a system causes more harm than it provides good, than it provides benefit. And that point, however we define it, however we measure it, however bad we are at figuring out where we are on that curve, is peak ecological water. And I think we could argue we've long passed the point of peak ecological water in the Everglades or the Aral Sea, where all 24 species of fish found only in the Aral Sea are now extinct. Or parts of the West Coast where salmon are now going extinct because of human withdrawals of water, or the Colorado River Delta where no longer any water reaches the delta. So there is a point of peak ecological water. We're not good at measuring it, but without a doubt, increasingly, we're passing that point. And we can no longer ignore that as well. But let me move forward. I said at the beginning, all of the news isn't bad, and I've just been giving you bad news, basically, up until now. Uh, but let me offer some observations that suggest that not only is there a path to a sustainable water future, what I call the soft path for water, uh, but that we're inevitably going to get there. It may be difficult, there may be more pain than, than we would like, but that inevitably we're going to reach a sustainable system. First of all, and let me raise six issues here. First of all, the water crisis is not the result of a lack of water or a lack of money or a lack of brains. There are very few places on the planet where there's not enough naturally occurring water to meet basic human needs for water, safe water, for sanitation, for drinking, for uh, bathing, for cooking, for cleaning. Uh, there are places on the planet where there's not enough water to grow all the food that a country may need or a region may need. And we have an international trading system that moves goods and services from one part of the planet to another. Uh, there are water scarcity problems, but ultimately our problem is not a lack of water. We're a rich world. We're rich in money. We're rich in education. We're rich in ingenuity. And admittedly, we may be a little less rich than we were a year ago. But the lack of money is not the reason why we're not addressing our water problems. And like water, those things, money and ingenuity and education, are not well distributed. They're badly distributed around the world. And for that reason, it gives some of us, those of us who may have more money or ingenuity or, or access to educational resources, a special responsibility to act. And we're intelligent beings. We've decoded the human genome. 
We manipulate substances, substances at the subatomic level. We built smart machines and technologies that are rolling around on other planets, often looking iron, uh, ironically enough for water. Uh, in September of 2008, for those of you who don't follow this, the Mars rovers actually observed snow falling out of the Martian sky. It just, it's just astounding to me. Now, whether or not because of climate change and warming we have to move there to do our skiing, I don't, I don't know. But. Second, the lack of infrastructure, supply infrastructure in particular, is not our problem. It's not limiting our ability to solve our water problems. I'd like to challenge the commonly held assumption that just a few more dams or a few more aqueducts or a few more groundwater wells will once and for all solve our water problems. I think there are, there are parts of the world where we need new infrastructure, where we need new dams and aqueducts and water treatment systems and groundwater wells, um, particularly in, in parts of the developing world. But even there, when we build that new infrastructure, we had better build it to a different set of standards, social and economic and environmental standards, than we built infrastructure in the 20th century, water infrastructure in the 20th century. But I also predict that if we build a few more dams, a few more aqueducts, a few more groundwater wells, that our water problems, the problems I've been describing, would disappear. I don't think that's true. We have this argument going on in California. Let's build a couple more dams. If there's a drought, uh, there's not enough warm water for farmers, we have to build a few more dams. There are no more places to build dams in California that meet any sort of economic, environmental, or social criteria that are acceptable. But we may go ahead and do that. That's the politics of the situation. But if we build them, our water problems will not disappear. We'll have the same problems tomorrow that we have today. It's not an infrastructure problem. It's a thinking problem. At the same time, there are some new kinds of infrastructure that we ought to consider more seriously. We have to continue to invest in our water quality infrastructure to make sure that our drinking water stays safe and reliable and cheap. We need new systems, maybe distributed systems, for wastewater purification and reuse. We need reliable distribution systems. Part of the problem isn't the water that we put into our our water systems at the top end, it's the pipes that deliver water to our homes. Let's halt the decay of the water infrastructure that we've spent a lot of money building and that we rely upon. Third, we have to stop taking the demand for water for granted or as fixed or immutable. The dynamics of the demand for water are changing in a remarkable way. In fact, I'm going to argue in many parts of the world, certainly in the United States, the dynamics of the demand for water have already changed. We have always assumed that as population grows exponentially and as our economy grows exponentially, that the demand for water would also grow exponentially. That's the way engineers are taught. That's the way water managers are taught. It's the fundamental planning assumption behind a lot of our resource use, not just water. This is no longer true. The United States uses less water today for everything than we used 20 years ago. This would be the one time where a PowerPoint slide would be good. But you'll have to imagine this. Up until 1980, if you look at the curves for population and economic growth, GNP, and water demand, they followed that exponential curve. But in 1980, those curves split apart in our economy, and our populations continue to grow exponentially until last, last year. Um, but our demand for water leveled off in the 1980s. We split apart those curves. We use less water today for everything than we used 20 years ago. And on a per capita basis, we use a lot less water, gallons per person in the United States than we used 20 years ago because populations continue to grow exponentially. How? Two, we two reasons. We've started to tap into the wasteful use of water. We've started to make water use more efficient, which I'll come back to in a second. And we've started to change the nature of our economy. We, we produce more dollars per gallon today because we're doing more things that take less water. Computers, communications, uh, uh, social services, less steel manufacturing, less 
petroleum refining, less chemical processing is a fraction of our economy. But those things are more water intensive. So our economy is changing in a structural way. Think about it this way. Our goal is not to use water. We don't want to use water. We want to grow food. We want to get rid of our wastes. We want to make semiconductors. Uh, uh, we want to do a lot of things. And almost everything that we want to do requires water, some amount of water. But what I'd like to do is argue that almost everything that we do that requires water, we could do with less water. We could be more efficient. We could improve our water use productivity. And again, I know you're going to hear a lot more about this later. And in the best sign that this is possible, more and more states and cities and regions and countries like the United States are starting to do this. We're becoming more efficient. We're growing more food with less water. We're making semiconductors with less water. Our homes use less water than they used to. Now, this brings me to camels. Now, all you have to do is look at the way a camel deals with water. Camels are remarkable animals. They are remarkably water efficient. Now, we tend to think, those of us who don't know anything about camels, we tend to think about camels have a hump and they store water in the hump, which isn't really true, but sort of true. But the most interesting thing about camels is they're incredibly water efficient designs because they've evolved in a place where water is a scarce, precious resource. Now, my mother's a camel. Um, and for those of you who don't have a clue what I'm talking about, I'm not going to go into any more detail, but talk to a Connecticut College student sitting next to you. Um, and I'm a combination of a bulldog and a camel, which makes me a tenacious water conservation something. I don't know. Okay. Fourth, we have to expand the definition of supply. In the past, we thought about supply as build another dam for storage, tap another lake or river, drill another groundwater well, move water from the next river over once this river next to us is used up. Um, those resources are largely overtapped now. And we have to start thinking about, we have to start rethinking supply. Supply is still a fundamental part of our water system. But let's think about smart conjunctive use of surface water and groundwater. Uh, let's relearn traditional methods of rainwater harvesting, a very important method of capturing and storing water. Let's think about treated wastewater. We spend a lot of money capturing wastewater, treating it to a very high standard, and often then throwing it away. Let's think about treated wastewater as an asset, as a source of supply, not as a liability. And when we do that, we realize that there are new ways of matching the quality of water we might have with the quality of water we might need. Uh, increasingly around the world, we are using treated wastewater, often very high quality wastewater, for all sorts of things, uh, for watering lawns and flushing toilets and meeting industrial needs and watering golf courses. It doesn't have to be potable reuse. It can be non-potable reuse. Let's look at desalination, other advanced water treatment systems, uh, let's develop accurate real-time water quality monitoring so we can have a better sense of the qualities of the water that we have so that we can put water to use more effectively. Fifth, water must be properly priced. The failure to price water properly leads to overuse and underinvestment and poor economic decisions. Most of us don't pay enough for water. But at the same time, Water has to be equitably priced. Let's properly price water, but if, if the poor are un unable to pay for water, water should be provided for free. There's a tension between the human right to water, and I believe very strongly there's a human right to water, and economically rational use of water. But there are ways of balancing the human right to water and proper pricing and proper economics of water. And that may mean eliminating sub some subsidies, and it may mean instituting other subsidies for water. We're smart enough to apply economics in the right way to our water challenges. Sixth and last, we have to expand our concepts of management and regulation and institutions around water. We've in the past focused on centralized institutions, centralized wastewater plants, centralized water treatment plants, centralized management structures, agencies, 
irrigation districts. Let's complement centralization with decentralized water systems. There are all sorts of things to be gained from decentralizing water infrastructure, water management, uh, water politics. A lot of water is local, not national or international. A lot of water is local and ought to be managed at the local level. We need to acknowledge the role of government to protect the public interest. There's a big debate about public versus private, and part of the role here, part of that debate is the debate about the proper role of governments versus corporations. But there is a fundamental public interest in water. It means developing and enforcing water quality standards and laws. That has to be a government responsibility. It means guaranteeing water for ecosystems. That has to be part of the public good. It means involving the public in decision-making about water, acknowledging and dealing with climate change, which is not just a, a national issue, it's a global issue. Uh, it means regulating the private sector's involvement in water. I think there's a role for the private sector, but it requires strong government oversight and regulation. In most places, the provision of water is a monopoly, whether it's private or public. That means you have to have public oversight. It means ending inappropriate subsidies for water and pork barrel water projects. It means addressing growth in a comprehensive and responsible manner. And it means doing more to reduce the risks of conflict over water. We have mechanisms to address both international and subnational conflicts over water. It means figuring out how to turn water from a source of conflict into a source of cooperation. We know how to do that, but the resources, the government efforts to address conflicts over water have not been adequate to what I think is a growing challenge. All of these approaches together, all of these components form a soft path for water, a path to a sustainable future. I think this is a remarkable time in water policy. There, there's a really, there's a lot of fascinating things going on. There are a lot of great people working in the water area. I think we face very serious risks and a water crisis. But I also believe that there are real, effective, affordable, attractive solutions that can get us from where we are to where we want to be, to a sustainable future. It's too easy to look into the crystal ball and to say uh, the future is going to be a disaster. I can see where we're heading, but I also know that where we're heading is, is where we don't want to go. And if we can think about a path to where we want to be, I think we have a chance of avoiding uh, making the water crisis worse than it is. Thank you very much.